So, the iPod. Younger customers get their music through a computer or these little handheld things called iPods. Even the most successful music stores are wondering, can they survive this? After the iPod had released in 2001, to say it became a cultural phenomenon would be a woeful understatement. You're talking about a thousand songs in your pocket, with the same type of hard drive you might stick in your computer. The iPod destroyed its competition, but that was 2001, and suddenly it's 2004. While the iPod had gotten better, so had surrounding alternatives. Players utilizing flash storage were the rising trend, weighing almost nothing and being absolutely tiny compared to the hard drives found in iPod pods, but they also cost a ludicrous amount of money while typically holding well under a hundred songs. At this point, iPod made up 31% of the portable music market, which is impressive, especially to be accomplished in just a few short years. But there was 60% of the market that was still essentially open season, particularly half of that that included pretty expensive MP3 players. So let's hear the Apple CEO describe the landscape as he presents at Macworld San Francisco in 2004. This is what these things generally look like. Have 256 megabytes of memory if they're useful. They hold 60 songs and they sell for $199. That's what this market represents in terms of the ones actively in use. They also have a really bad user interface. Well, we are going to introduce the second member of the iPod family today, the iPod Mini. Hey, how's it going? I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and the iPod Mini is one of the most unique Apple products to ever hit store shelves, and one unlike really anything we've seen from them in recent history. In 2004, Apple was actually still called Apple Computer, and they wouldn't drop the second half until the iPhone in 2007. It did not take them as long to drop the iPod Mini. There were only two generations, and it was around for less than two years before Apple scrapped it in favor of better technology, specifically the iPod Nano and iPod Shuffle. This is notable because the iPod Mini was a massive success. It was selling much better than its larger counterpart, and by all accounts and purposes, should have been the future. But flash storage was better, and it got to the point where it was cheap enough that Apple could move to that, and they made the absolutely enormous risk of just canning the iPod Mini at the time second generation in favor of two new iPods that had never been sold before. And the iPod Mini established so many precedents for Apple moving forward. The first aluminum iPod, there was no stainless steel. They had colors right from the get-go. It was the first iPod with the click wheel. The iPod third generation, which was the newest at the time, looked completely different. And actually, it's probably the strangest looking iPod, at least of the classics. Nothing really beats that third generation iPod shuffle that doesn't have any buttons, but I digress. The iPod Mini might be forgotten by most, or even not known about, but it's a really cool device and some amazing tech. I think just this once, it deserves the spotlight. In this video, we're going over everything about the iPod mini, where it came from, where it went, and its residual impacts on Apple moving forward, even into the iPhone days, even today. CD sales have dropped almost one quarter in just three years. That's an awful lot of lost business. These stores attract older collectors who want original CDs. Younger customers, by contrast, just download, listen, and when they're bored, they delete, which may account for the parent success of a new online music store from Apple Computer called iTunes. When we think back to the monopolizing done by iPod and iTunes as they overwhelmed the entire music industry, it's easy to forget the first few years were actually pretty slow for sales, at least relative to the success that would come shortly after. In the winter quarter of 2001, Apple would sell about 125,000 units, which seems so low nowadays, but it was huge for them. In early 2003, Jobs would note that Apple had sold more than 600,000 iPods in the 14 months since its launch. 14 months, 600,000 iPods iPods. A lot of iPods, but very low compared to later numbers. We're skipping ahead a little bit, but for perspective, January 2006, Jobs said that Apple had sold 42 million since the device launched in 2001. 600,000 to 42 million in three years. You might be starting to see why the iPod mini was kind of a big deal, even if it didn't stick around. So where was the turning point? What suddenly went right? We're talking about the iPod mini, so surely that was a big deal. And it was. But the real 
turning point came in 2003 with the launch of the iTunes Store. We acquire our music off CDs, right? But we all know that starting in 1999, there was this phenomenon called Napster. It demonstrated that the internet was made for music delivery. The good side is it offers users near instant gratification. The downside is it's stealing. You can say, well, why has this proliferated? Well, because there's no legal alternative. Jobs would speak in 2003 about a music piracy, and what he had to say was absolutely brilliant. Instead of just writing it off as evil and illegal, he embraced it, and he talked about the convenience of it. He admitted that there were no easier options. This is not something you would typically hear from a big business like Apple, someone as important as Steve Jobs saying that the easiest way to get music was piracy. But it was true, few music stores existed online, and the ones that did often had expensive subscription models, or they might only have certain artists or any other number of issues. The only legal way to get music was often to buy an expensive CD that would give you the entire album, whether you wanted just a single song or all of them. And then you have to rip the CD and then transfer it via iTunes to your iPod. So this presentation would represent a huge turning point for Apple, one they would never look back from, as it not only managed to change the music industry forever, but the entire world at large, as everything we now have really does stem from this, the iTunes store. And it features one-click shopping. Only Apple and Amazon offer one-click shopping. You click one button, your credit card is charged, the download starts. The iTunes music store is what we're going to call this. Steve Jobs not only didn't write off piracy, he wanted to compete with it, and he absolutely would succeed. Songs only cost 99 cents, and you could hear a sample before buying. Then just plug in your iPod and it would sync the same songs to the iPod, along with as many playlists as you could ever desire. The thousand songs in your pocket had expanded pretty greatly by the time of the third generation iPod as well. Introduced April 2003, not only did it completely change the design in a very strange way, when it launched it would have 10, 15, and 30 gigabyte options. And by the end of 2003, there would be a 40 gig option. That's a lot of music, and frankly nobody needs that much music, at least very few people do. And that's another reason the iPod mini would succeed, but again we'll get to that. A major feature introduced with the third gen iPod was the 30 pin dock connector. Yeah, that might look familiar, it should. It was the same connector that would be used on the first iPhone all the way to the iPhone 4S before the iPhone 5 would get rid of it altogether. 2003 to 2012, it was only around for nine years, but it felt like a lot longer. And the design, I mean, what do you even say about this? The touch wheel was still touch, just like it had been on the second generation iPod. The first one was an actual scroll wheel, which was pretty cool, but they removed the buttons from around the wheel to put them up at the top, and they were touch buttons. They weren't physically pushing in, they were capacitive touch. They lit up, which was cool, and they were also indented so you could still pretty easily figure out which button was which. You needed that, otherwise it would have been very, very difficult to hit the right button consistently. Even so, I can't help but think this design kind of sucks. Before, you could use your thumb to scroll the wheel and then just barely move it to hit one of the buttons like play, pause, whereas now you would actually have to stretch up and hit one of the buttons above, which wasn't really that difficult, but there was also no physical feedback. Capacitive touch buttons like these are going to inherently be less reliable because you might not tap it right and you don't really know because there's no physical indication of whether or not you actually got it. It might seem like nitpickiness, but there's a reason they never brought this design back. It just wasn't very good. Even so, it definitely is one of the more unique iPods, and it did some things right. The nice curvature and the white plastic elements of it does feel a lot nicer than the second and first generation, and the red backlights behind the buttons was admittedly pretty cool in the dark. Overall, besides the design, it wasn't really a huge jump from the previous iPods. Apple would need something that really struck a chord with consumers, something that actually pushed the envelope again, something innovative. And so that's exactly what they would do in early 2004. Yep, we're finally there. It's time to talk about the forgotten iPod mini. And so let's take a look at this. It's got 16 times the storage, 16 times the music, it's half the thickness, and it's 50 bucks more. This is the best 50 bucks you'll ever spend. What's it look like? This is the iPod and it's pretty small, but this is the mini. It's even smaller and it's pretty stunning. The iPod mini would sell like hotcakes when it came out, thrusting Apple into the limelight that they would never step back from. Everything they've done in technological and even societal innovation stems not only from the first iPod, but perhaps even more so the iPod mini, as it in conjunction with the success across the line gave them the freedom and revenue to be more bold with future products, such as a certain multi-touch display smartphone that would be coming a few years later. The iPod mini was small, but the impact it made sure wasn't. We'll talk about sales estimates in the final chapter, but for now, let's take a look at the first iPod mini itself. 
We have a whole family of colors with the iPod Mini. It is the size of a business card. The anodized aluminum seamlessly curves over the smooth sides and came in five colors. Silver, gold, pink, blue, and green. The gold iPod Mini is considered the rarest of any of them, as the second generation dropped the color completely, no doubt due to lower sales. Keep in mind, to this point, iPods had only come in white, so for Apple to have this many colors was kind of a big deal. The aluminum, not aluminium because this is an American product, was light and practical for this sort of device. And along with the colors, it would help serve as a clear indication that this was a separate entity from the normal iPod. People really like having options to make a device feel more personal and unique, and so having something as simple as different colors to choose from can be a genuinely enticing factor for consumers. We have the solid state scroll wheel, patent pending, and we've added buttons right on it. When you finish scrolling, you just push it and it just clicks in like this. There was no room for the same touch wheel and button layout as seen on the third gen iPod, so we would finally get the first ever click wheel. You would scroll by touching the wheel and spinning your finger as normal, but then pushing in at the edges would have it click in and serve as the basic buttons in the four directions for controlling your music. It was smart, intuitive, and thankfully provided that physical feedback and the click to indicate that you pushed it correctly. The click wheel inevitably became absolutely iconic as it was practical, visually appealing, and essentially the perfect way to navigate and use the iPod's UI. This click wheel design would stick around until the rise of touchscreens on every iPod except the shuffle, though Apple started making the wheel themselves rather than relying on synaptics with their later generations. Not only was it good design and highly intuitive, but it was also just more satisfying and even more fun to use. We humans are a funny bunch, and just to show what I mean, what do you prefer here? The sound of me pressing an iPod 3rd gen's buttons? Or the sound of an iPod mini's buttons? When you have a product that's aesthetically pleasing, comfortable to hold and use, and even more satisfying to interact with, sounds like a winning combination to me, although that's just a small part of what made the iPod mini so revolutionary. It might feel odd to focus on the click wheel of all things, but it's genuinely the most prominent indicator of the iPod brand, even 20 years later, and as well as that, not much else on this iPod is nearly as fun to look at. The monochrome LCD is 1.67 inches with a resolution of 138 by 110 and like with previous iPods, it does have a backlight that will turn off quickly to help retain battery life. And battery life was the main prevailing complaint from both critics and consumers. It was roughly the same as the third generation, at around 8 hours of audio listening, which wasn't particularly impressive even in 2004. On the top of the device is white plastic, with the hold slider on the left and a couple ports on the right. The circular one is naturally the headphone jack, for my fellow baby boomers who actually remember that. The smaller, wider port there is one you may not recognize, but it was a standard feature of early iPods, the remote port. And these days, you didn't have inline controls built into your earbuds yet, like you might remember getting with your old iPhone, so instead, there were accessories like this you could buy and plug in directly. Often it would use both top ports, and this remote specifically was a radio tuner as well, and came bundled with the third gen classic. The website Elite Obsolete Electronics sells it for $40, so iPod mini users of the world rejoice, you can still get one today. The silver hold slider acts like it does on all iPods, slide it over, and when it shows red, the device won't accept any input from the click wheel. This is to avoid the iPod equivalent of pocket dialing, so moving around won't accidentally skip through your playlist or send a desperate sounding text message to your ex. On the bottom of the iPod we have that oh so familiar 30 pin charging port, which is actually compatible with both Firewire and USB 2.0. They're two different standards, but it used to be Firewire only on the original iPods. Apple had been moving away from that because USB 2.0 was better on a technical level, and it was also kind of rare for Windows PCs to even have a Firewire port in the first place. I do find it interesting that they chose plastic for the top and bottom of this device, but it's not built as an all-in-one piece casing because these iPods are meant to be opened up for repair and battery replacements when need be. Flash storage iPods like the Nano would be eventually a bit more closed off, but the iPod mini used of course the physical hard drive, which we'll talk about shortly, and those are always susceptible to dying or having issues down the line. One complaint about these aluminum iPods, and actually any iPod ever made, is the durability, specifically when it comes to scratching. The stainless steel casings on the classics and the iPod touches, those were the worst by far, aside from the plastic displays on the first iPod Nano, but even with this nice aluminum, the Mini can scratch fairly easily, which is why Apple would come out with a brilliant ultimate solution that would solve everyone's complaints, as well as world hunger, and bring about true everlasting world peace, at least until the removal of the headphone jack in 2016, since which the world has really gone downhill. This accessory was so glorious, so beautiful, I hesitate to even show it, but here you go. Today, we're introducing a revolutionary new product for your iPod, socks. They're really cool, actually. You can put your iPod in them. They keep your iPod warm on cold days. Six colors. 
and uh, you get one of each in a little package and they're gonna go on sale by mid-November for $29. This here is the whole reason I made this video. It's a bunch of socks you could purchase for your iPod separately. Please don't cry, for perhaps one day humanity will again achieve such a standard of greatness. All jokes aside, not that any of that was joking, obviously, the iPod socks were uh, not a very popular product. They did not sell well, making them pretty difficult to find today, at least according to Austin, as he tried to make excuses for his website not having the best accessory ever made for anything. I'm not gonna waste more time on other strange and interesting side products because this video is getting long enough, but I did think the socks were notable because of course they were. I mean, who doesn't want a toque for their iPod? Toque meaning beanie for the uncultured swine among us. We've examined pretty thoroughly the design of the iPod mini, talked about the click wheel, so let's briefly look at the user interface. It's pretty great and fully standard from your run-of-the-mill iPod from the era. The backlight was helpful when needed, the low pixel density and monochrome is dated, but it does the job just fine, and the software itself is naturally intuitive and satisfying to use. The little tick sound I've always loved while you scroll through your music or settings, just typical Apple thinking about the small things. The OS itself is just a shrunk down version of what you would find on an iPod Classic. There's nothing too crazy, playlist music. Under extras we have some interesting stuff like notes so you can drag in text files, calendar, set alarms, contacts, and most importantly games. All of which are very simple but would keep you entertained for a few minutes if need be. I'd take a closer look at the UI if it wasn't just copied and pasted from previous iPod Classics, but it is and that's a very good thing because Apple's UI was the best out of anybody. Nothing too wild but it's still fun to mess with all the same. Now, iPod mini we think is going to be a great great second member to the iPod family. So finally, we're now at the last thing to cover with this first generation iPod mini. As we established earlier, flash storage was still too expensive and too low capacity to be practical for a portable music player in 2004. And keep in mind that the first iPod when it came out in 01 was already by a long shot the smallest high capacity MP3 player on the market thanks to the innovative new Toshiba hard drive that measured 1.8 inches in diameter. Portable jukeboxes at the time would use basically a laptop drive which measures at 2.5 inches here I have one as an example with the iPod on top of it just to see the size difference. And the iPod is already a good bit smaller, so for it to have to hold a full-size 2.5-inch drive like this one would have required a much larger casing. The iPod mini would repeat the exact same pattern of innovation. This was thanks to the latest and greatest hard drive tech on the market, the micro drive, which was only one inch in diameter, and coming in four gigabytes was still able to hold what came to roughly a thousand songs. Suddenly, just like that, we were replicating the same thing with the first iPod, smaller hard drive tech without giving up capacity. The Mini could hold what was really the best possible number of songs for the average user, and it had an updated, very visually appealing design that was helping it stand out from the market and even Apple's own higher capacity iPods. There was just so much to love with the iPod Mini, especially the socks. But even if we put the socks to the side here, which you should never do, we really come down to four main points for the iPod Mini's success. The size, which was now smaller. The design, which was appealing. Interaction, the click wheel made it so easy to use the OS and play and pause your music and everything you'd want to do. And of course, accessibility. With iTunes and the iTunes Store, it was easier than ever to buy and sync music. And now you could use your Windows PC with actual iTunes and a USB cable. With all of this, the iPod mini was in a prime position to fully and utterly dominate the market, which is exactly what would end up happening. Now, note those four things we talked about though. Size, design, interaction, accessibility. These are the four things that made the first iPod such a success. This really shows how fast that technology developed. It was like two and a half a years for the iPod mini to come out after the first iPod. Two and a half years to go from a 1.8 inch drive, which was already unheard of, to a one inch drive. So what was next? What would come in the future? What was going to be the next big innovation and leap for iPod? Well, before we find that out, we have to talk about the second generation iPod mini, which would be sold for less than a year. Now, a year ago, we introduced a new product called the iPod mini to go after the high end of the flash market. I am pleased to report that the iPod's market share has doubled to 65%. So, what's next? The computer world is moving more towards media, and media is moving more towards computers with the advent of digital music. They're kind of meeting in the middle. Apple's core expertise outside of phenomenally good engineering is really to figure out how to make complex technology easy to use by us mere mortals. And I think, you know, that's what we strive to do in the music space and in the computer space. Before the release of the second generation iPod mini, it was already abundantly clear the iPod line as a whole was rocketing to the moon in both sales and cultural attention. Even 
even if you wouldn't necessarily want a mini iPod as you perhaps needed more storage space, this success made it exponentially more likely you might hear about the iPod in general. The more buzz and talk surrounding a product in day-to-day -day life means more people are going to be inclined to buy one, even if they don't consciously realize that they're being influenced. That's why advertisements on billboards and stuff are so effective. You might not actually read it as you pass by it, but your brain subconsciously does pick up what it is. And from the get-go in 2001, the device had become a mainstay in pop culture, often featured in TV shows, movies, and so on, which led to the reputation of it being the new hip and happening device. Having those white earbuds poking out of your ears was a genuine fashion statement. Even if the iPod mini wasn't necessarily completely outperforming the regular iPod, just getting the brand out there with that new product was going to lead to more and more new customers, whether they went for a mini or opted for the larger one. And don't forget, while the first generation iPod mini was in my opinion the best iPod ever made to that point of its release, Apple didn't just go radio silent over the next year. July 2004 saw the release of the fourth generation iPod, which adopted the click wheel and otherwise basically retained the smooth white plastic casing of the third gen, which is now slightly slimmer. The price saw a decent drop as the lowest model cost 300 US dollars and had 20 gigabytes, while the year's previous third gen started at 10 gigabytes for the same price. It's a good example of how fast storage technology was advancing. Inflation adjusted, by the way, a 300 US dollar iPod is now about $500, and the iPod mini at 250 bucks in 2004 is right about 400. Aside from the absolutely terrifying fact that inflation has risen 60% in under 20 years, even back then these were not cheap devices by any means. This leaves a huge hole in Apple's lineup before the budget market. So the iPod mini was cheaper, but it wasn't cheap, it was mainly just there to be smaller. And so even before the second generation iPod mini, Apple would add a third iPod to their lineup in January 2005. With all of our iPod users last year, they discovered a new way to listen to their music. And what is that? Shuffle. And so today, we are introducing the iPod Shuffle, and this is what it looks like. It's unbelievable. While it wasn't yet known, the iPod Shuffle would represent the beginning of the end for the short-lived iPod Mini line. It would come only a month before the second-gen iPod Mini, which launched to essentially no fanfare, as Apple didn't even have an event for it. They simply would publish a press release and update their website with the newer, technically superior model. How was it superior? Well, that's the thing. It really wasn't, for the most part, with adjustments that could have been qualified as mid-generation revisions had it not been for the lack of any direct successor. But first, we did see that iPod shuffle. Apple's first ever flash player, and boy, was it ever awesome. While Apple had made the iPod mini to bite a huge chunk of the high-end flash market, something that had been readily accomplished, the success would give them further motivation to focus on their next necessary source of income, the lower end of the flash market. This is where the iPod shuffle would fit perfectly. Costing $100 and fitting right in with the rest of the junk with a single massive exception, it actually didn't suck, and the compromises made may have in a sense reduced the experience, but it came at the major benefit of simplification and streamlining music to be as simple as humanly possible. Shuffle was the big buzzword Apple had been running with, as it was an amazing feature on iPod. Having songs play in a random order was the ideal for most users, as there's a lot less joy to be had when you always know which song is going to come next. So the Shuffle took out the middleman and got rid of any screen or user interface whatsoever, because it only did the one thing, it would shuffle. Well, technically two things, because you could also play songs sequentially if you preferred, with a toggle to go between either or. Its design was simple but efficient, and taking off the cap reveals the USB connector, turning the iPod into essentially a USB flash drive, which actually was an extra layer of functionality with the universal formatting of FAT32, making it work to store files from both Mac or Windows. Of course, it also charged the device in this fashion. The battery life was around 12 hours, definitely better than the first generation Mini's 8. By removing choice and any screen or UI, Apple had ensured two big benefits. One, the shuffle was the exact opposite of intimidating, unlike the vast majority of competitors. Less options was a concession worth it for the crowd buying at this price point. And that's the second big thing, cost efficiency. The shuffle was actually surprisingly reasonably priced at $100 for the 512 megabyte model, and the prices would frequently go down with time and sales. Half a gig is not a lot of space on paper, but it is enough for a lot of songs, and thanks to flash storage, the device was small, light, and really fast. And for perspective, the fourth gen iPod shuffle that was sold all the way until mid-2017 had only two gigabytes. Storage space wasn't the appeal of such a small and lightweight device, convenience was. The iPod Shuffle deserves its own video, so I won't go any more in depth here, but I wanted to make it clear how appetizing this was, even compared to Apple's own superior alternatives. The iPod Mini, as it would hit its first anniversary mark, needed significant improvements to keep up with the ever-expanding tech space, but unfortunately, that just wasn't in the cards. February 23rd, 2005 saw the announcement and immediate launch of the 
iPod Mini second generation. All from a press release and not a whole lot else. But given the changes being made, it wasn't really a surprise. The second iPod Mini was nearly identical to the first generation, with very few distinguishable, visible, or even internal differences, the few of which we will discuss now. The first differing design element was the new colors, or more accurately, the more vibrant colors. Gold was dropped altogether, but the others remained in a now brighter, happier palette, which I personally really prefer. Silver did remain the same, but otherwise, the first-gen colors felt kind of dull in comparison. It's a bit of a pity the gold was dropped, in my opinion, but hey, we would see it later with iPhone, specifically the iPhone 5S, as that would be the first time Apple brought a color separate from the white and black to their premium iPhone flagship. Yeah, the 5C happened at the same time, but it was plastic and lower tier, so either way, it's kind of funny that gold became so darn popular almost 10 years later, to the point we still are seeing gold iPhones today. A super nice touch that's probably one of the easiest things to notice in comparing the two generations is the colored lettering on the click wheel. The first gen has gray for menu, skip forward, back, play, pause, whereas the second gen color matched them to the aluminum, which is really aesthetically pleasing. Besides the colors, the other indicator between generations is the storage capacity etched into the back. As you can see, my green second gen is 4 gigabytes. This wasn't on the first gen, because 4 gigs was the sole option, but the second gen did have a second 6 gigabyte tier if you wanted just that extra little bit of space. There were also some interesting branding done back here with companies that cooperated with Apple like HP and who knows how many more. Austin from Elite Obsolete Electronics has some pretty cool ones in his collection that you'd probably see if you followed him and I on Twitter. We mentioned earlier the battery life was likely the most critiqued point of contention for the iPod Mini, managing the same as the third gen iPod and an underwhelming eight hours of playback. But luckily the second gen fixed that altogether, bringing it up to an almost staggering 18 hours, well over double the original playtime. Naturally, this brought up manufacturing costs, so to make up for that, Apple would get rid of the Firewire cable and AC adapter from the second gen box, marking the beginning of the huge reduction in accessories that has eventually led to a single Apple sticker, a lightning cable, and a slap in the face that comes with iPhones in the 2020s. Maybe that's a weird thing to point out, but it's actually true. Old iPods came with a lot of stuff. The third gen iPod even came with a dock and everything. Because this tech was all new, people didn't yet have the cables or accessories in their homes, and so rather than make people purchase it separately, Apple would just include it in the initial pricing of iPods, with almost too much coming in the box along with it. And that's kind of just about it for highlights between the iPod mini generations. There really wasn't much of a change needed with the first mini selling so well. The click wheel and small form factor was enough to keep the 2005 iPod Mini still very much relevant and appealing for consumers, as stock for the Mini had constantly been short, and with that there really wasn't too much motivation to make sweeping changes only a single year later. And of course, Apple had big plans for the end of the year and the end of the Mini altogether. But before we get to that, we do need to talk about a couple more major upgrades to the iPod line, specifically regarding the fourth generation. It did come out July 2004, but Apple would straight up outdo it completely only that October, where they also revealed the U2 edition, which was black and red and featured the typical monochrome display. That would be really cool if it wasn't for the fact that at the same event, you also got the iPod Photo, a premium version of the 4th gen iPod featuring for the first time a full color LCD. It was called Photo because, and get this, it could hold photos and even be hooked up to a display with the included composite cable that would plug into the headphone jack. It might seem a bit confusing that Apple wouldn't just save the color screen for a new iPod generation altogether, right? Well, prepare to be even more lost as in June 2005, the iPod Photo would merge together with all of the fourth generations, forming one ultimate iPod color, as it's been dubbed, or iPod with color display. Black and white iPod 4, U2 iPod 4, iPod photo, iPod color, why simplify your lineup when you can instead make it as messy as possible for the random low tier YouTuber talking about it 20 years later? All this aside, it was a really big deal for iPod to have a color display, and the lack of it on the mini did make it a lot less appealing than it was only a year prior. The eventual fifth gen iPod, coming October 05, would completely revamp what an iPod even even was. As being dubbed the iPod Video, it was capable of playing full-on movies and TV episodes on its gorgeous 320 by 240 2.5-inch display. That might sound sarcastic, but I actually don't mean it to be. The iPod Video was huge for the industry, and that display was really good for the time. This all made the way for iTunes to expand beyond just music into full-on legacy media. The quote from Steve Jobs at the beginning of the chapter wasn't there for no reason, as right after that iPod Shuffle unveiling, he was already discussing how traditional and digital media were combining and how it would be the future. 
future. He knew full well what was upcoming, and along that road would come the abrupt but perhaps not completely unexpected discontinuation of the iPod Mini, as it was replaced by an objectively superior device, albeit one that doesn't enjoy the same longevity and community elements the iPod Mini and Classics still have today. September 7th, 2005 would see the end of the iPod Mini line and the rise of Apple's flashy new device, the flash-based iPod Nano, which would see seven generations spanning from its inception all the way until July 2017. Is Apple now a digital media company? Is it still a computer company? What is it? Well, you know, Apple loves to make great products. We didn't want to make one more flash player. We wanted to make one of the smallest and lightest and best ones in the world, and so that's where iPod Shuffle comes from. You ever wonder what this pocket's for? Well, now we know because this is the new iPod Mini. Welcome to where we still are today, the Flash Generation. Instantaneous anything and everything, wherever and whenever. The iPod Nano would mark a huge shift in Apple as a company, as they were already starting to gear up towards the move to iPhone, though this wouldn't be made clear until well after the Nano first launched, and at the time it was a pretty understandable upgrade over the Mini, justifying the latter's complete discontinuation. It went to a more bland but recognizable black and white plastic palette. Black was actually new for iPod at the time, technically unless you count that U2 edition, and there was the stainless steel backing we all recognize so well, with this same design being essentially copied and pasted for the larger iPod 5th generation coming only a month later. The Nano had a color display, making it feel light years ahead of the Mini despite not even being a year newer. With the Nano, there was now no longer any benefit to the iPod Mini, flash storage was smaller, much faster, and more durable, better in every possible way, and finally at the point where Apple could affordably include it in their entry-level iPods. And so, this leads leaves the Mini to where it stands today, a footnote in a product line full of otherwise pretty massive historical significance. The first iPod had started it all. The iPod Shuffle brought Apple into the generation of flash storage. The iPod Nano kicked off an even more absurd era of popularity and sales, and of course the iPod Touch was a major key player in multi-touch devices becoming the mainstay solution for all things both compact and portable. Why is the iPod Mini forgotten? Two major reasons, in my opinion. Less than two years of being sold will result in almost any product being forgotten two decades later. And more importantly, there was a lack of sales. Yeah, lack of sales, that's right, even though I've been saying throughout this video that it was massively popular, and it was. I'm not contradicting myself, you just need to keep the context of Apple's overall presence in mind. While the Mini sold extremely well through its lifespan, Apple's exponential growth didn't stop around the 40 million mark seen early 2006. It kept going onwards and upwards, reaching the hundreds of millions. And nowadays, in the age of iPhone, the number of iPod Mini sales seen would be enough to cancel a product altogether and deem it a universal failure within the tech industry. It is really difficult to put down a number for how many minis were sold because Apple doesn't make this info available. But given that, according to ChatGPT, CNET claims the iPod mini made up 50% of iPod sales during its peak, which I'd assume likely makes up from its inception to at least when the iPod photo launched, if not the iPod shuffle, most estimates seem to say 5 to 10 million total units sold, but I would actually wager the number is at least a little closer to 10 to 15 million units sold. Maybe I'm off, but keep in mind, not long before the iPod Mini came out, not even a million iPods had been sold yet. This iPod was a Mini, but its impact on the tech industry certainly wasn't, and the ripple effect caused from its release is still being felt today, in any and every Apple product releasing year over year. You're already seeing it in society now, where people are becoming more and more familiar with interacting with intelligent electronic devices and uh, that's changing things culturally. It's a step along the way. Ultimately, the iPod Mini is nearing 20 years old, and with the tiny monochrome display and relatively chunky build compared to the space-age computers we have with us at all times, it's going to be easily overlooked within Apple's large historical lineup since Steve Jobs returned in the late 90s. Even so, it may not surprise you to hear that the iPod still has a very niche but thriving community around it, and among that is the even nicher group of devoted iPod Mini owners. And why wouldn't you want an iPod? iPod Mini if you prefer owning and downloading your music rather than streaming from a service that theoretically could pull the plug at any time. There are so many benefits to having physical copies and downloads even today as the downsides of the online era have become more and more prominent year over year. It's no wonder so many still turn to iPods almost a decade later after Apple stopped selling their final classic. And iPod Minis have aged fantastically thanks to how easy they are to open up, repair, and modify. You can swap in some flash storage, a new battery, sync it with your 
your iTunes library and boom, you're jamming out to whatever music you actually properly have ownership of, or sail the seven seas for. No Bluetooth, no color display, absolutely zero frills with the iPod mini, but it works, it's functional, it is a portable music player, and it plays music. At its core, it has one purpose, but it accomplishes that goal simply and perfectly. For the record here, I'm not sponsored, but the owner of the website Elite Obsolete Electronics is a good buddy of mine and has provided me with most of the iPods you'll have seen here, including both iPod minis. His online store at eoe.works has what is easily the best collection of retro Apple stuff available, with a huge emphasis on iPods and customization. We're talking colors, faster and larger storage, everything you could dream of, or you can even buy those original unmodified models ready and refurbished if you'd prefer that, or want to upgrade it yourself. I'm not saying you should go out and buy an iPod Classic or iPod Mini because frankly, while it's cool, it's probably not going to be necessary alongside your iPhone 17 Pro Ultra Max SR Mega XDR Retina Mini. But if there are those of you who find yourself yearning for simpler times in a device that does one single thing, but does it extremely well, don't hesitate to do your part to keep the iPod brand alive. Apple discontinued their final iPod in the seventh generation touch in 2022, after 10 years of basically radio silence, except for a couple small spec bumps. But just because Apple's left the past behind doesn't mean we have to, at least not fully. The iPod mini was as revolutionary as a device this boring can possibly get. Sure, it was colorful, but beyond that, it was just a smaller iPod. A smaller iPod that happened to be exactly what consumers wanted in 2004 to 2005. And you know what? It's still a pretty great iPod, even approaching 20 years later. The iPod mini may be small, but its influence, its legacy, and its monumental impact sure isn't. Big shout out to Josh. Smash like. I love iPods. Please don't put that in the video. So we see that it is possible uh, in our lifetimes for a process like this to radically influence the way that we work and even start to look at life. And so with that, I think we're finally right about done here. If it isn't obvious, I really love this iPod, and I think it's a pity that it was so fast forgotten. But how could it not be when it was sold for less than two years? And yet all of this was so perfectly typical of Steve Jobs' era Apple, him being willing to can a wildly successful product because he knew the world was ready for something better. I can't see Tim Cook doing the same. I hope you all enjoyed the video, and if you did, please consider liking and subscribing for more content just as painfully long and drawn out as this. I've had this video in the works for months now, but but finally decided to just get it done. It's a very niche product, and so it may not do too well for views, I don't know, but I'd really appreciate if you shared the video and liked it to help make up for the way too many hours I've wasted as I somehow have stretched out Apple's shortest lived product into a video essay well over a half hour long. I like to joke around, but I genuinely do love old tech like this just so much. The hardware, absolutely, but perhaps even more so, the story behind it and the cascade effect of how it's led to where the tech industry stands today. For those of you who've owned or are even still using the iPod mini, definitely please share your experiences in the comments. Feels like a rarity to know someone who even knows what the iPod mini is, much less has actually used one. And if you've ever owned iPod socks, congratulations for being among the best that humanity has to offer. So with that, thank you so much for watching. It means so much to me that you made this far. I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and I will see you all next time.